chapter 6. Uh, and this morning, uh, we're going to finish up this section, which is the second section that we're noting in chapter 6. And then uh, next week, we'll finish up the uh, chapter and the book. Uh, next week in verses 11 through 18, it's kind of his closing remarks, but he also talks about hypocrisy, you know, uh, doing one thing and uh, uh, saying another. So uh, we'll talk about that next week when we get there. But this morning, uh, we continue on in our understanding of uh, giving and having grace and operating uh, to produce divine good, again, the fruit of the Spirit by giving, and especially giving to our pastor teacher. I hear a little echo. Do you want to turn that down just a little bit? And as you know, our memory verse, Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. And that good, acceptable, and perfect talk about the three stages of spiritual adulthood that we are to grow to where we are producing divine good that is good, acceptable, and perfect in the eyes of God. So tonight, uh, this morning we're going to talk uh, more about love having agape love, because really we started that in chapter 5, as you know, as the seventh characteristic of having Christ formed in you. It was all about having agape love, impersonal and unconditional love for your fellow mankind. That was the seventh of the uh, seven characteristics of Christ formed in you. And then that launched into the, what the rest of chapter 5 was about after that, which was producing divine good, because you are walking by means of God the Holy Spirit. As you know, in order to execute the spiritual life, we have to be filled by God the Holy Spirit. From the moment of our salvation, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it opened, it, and it happens to every believer at the moment that they say, yes, I believe that your son died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. Immediately, they receive 40 things, and one of them is the baptism or the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit. And then, as you go forward in your spiritual walk, the filling of the Spirit is something that you can lose. You gain it, again, when you confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9, and you regain the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, because your, your soul is cleansed from experiential unholiness and unrighteousness. <clears throat> And then, therefore, when you confess, you have the cleansing of your vessel and you are filled with God the Holy Spirit once again. That all ultimately means that He is functional and operating within your soul, helping you to learn Bible doctrine, helping you to cycle Bible doctrine, helping you to apply Bible doctrine in your life. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, now you can truly operate in the love of God and ultimately you produce the fruit of the Spirit. And love is that main characteristic that, again, the greatest commandment of all is love your your neighbor as you love yourself. And Jesus Christ even said, a greater commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. In other words, he loved us so much that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. He gave his life both physically and spiritually so that we could have everlasting and eternal life. And therefore, he laid down his life in love uh, for each and every one of us. And we ought to love that way as well and love graciously. And as we now are talking about in this uh, section of chapter 6, love by giving. Again, we give of our time, our talent, or our treasure. And this, this uh, specific uh, part of this uh, chapter talks about giving of our treasure, supposedly, uh, specifically monetarily giving in support of our church and our pastor teacher. But we know the broader concept of our overall giving of our time, our talent, or our treasure. All right, so let's look at chapter 6, uh, verse 6, all the way down to the verse 10, and then we'll come back and explain it in a little bit further detail <clears throat> as we wrap it up. Now, in verse 6, which we've already noted in detail, it says, And let the one who is taught the word, that's you in the congregation, share all good things with him who teaches. That's me, the pastor teacher. And again, share all good things. Again, all good things is what God has given to you. You see, God blesses you each and every day. He gives you life. To live. He gives you breath to breathe so that you can go forward. He's given you a spirit. He's given you a Holy Spirit so that you can execute the plan of God and live fantastically in this life. He has given you all those logistical grace blessings of food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and the Word of God so that you can go forward inside His plan. All good things that we receive from, the, from God, we are then to share with Him who teaches. And so of the material blessings that God gives to us personally, we are to share that with our pastor teacher. Then it goes on to say, do not be deceived in verse 7. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. And then we have in verse 8 the two forms of sowing that we could perform. 
For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. <clears throat> but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. So the first part is talking about human good, uh, which is a uh, sin and evil. And then the second half is talking about divine good, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Then in verse 9, it says, and let, let us not lose heart in doing good. Again, divine good production, the fruit of the Spirit. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So again, as we noted in verse 6 and going back there, we're to share our material blessings with our local assembly so that the pastor teacher can be provided for. Uh, Paul also wrote to Timothy, again, this uh, uh, first and, uh, and second letter to Timothy are what we call pastoral epistles. He was giving instructions to the pastor as to how to run the congregation and how to function and operate, but there's a lot of messages in there as well to the congregation as to what they should do and how they should operate. And in chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, we have one of them that says, the elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, not just single honor, again, not just one blessing every now and again, but double honor, really raising them up on high. Not in the, you know, uh, you know not, uh, you know, puffing up their head in ego uh, and, and allowing them to become egomaniacs, as many pastors have done over the years, but ultimately the double, double honor is really giving graciously to these individuals, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. And this is why, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And that phrase, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, uh, goes back to the Old Testament law and an example that they gave in the physical realm. As the ox was threshing out the grain, again, they would uh, drag behind them this big plate of iron or some kind of metal, and it may have spikes or studs in it. And as it would grow, go over the grain, it would separate the outer shell of the grain from the inner portion of the good grain that you could eat and make bread out of. And while the ox was doing that day and night, you know, day after day after day, you know, hour after hour throughout the day, threshing over that, uh, that grain so that ultimately it could be uh, a, a provisions for the people, it could provide for the people, they were to allow the ox to eat some of that grain and let him eat while he was threshing and not say, oh, no, all that grain, we need all that grain. That grain is just for us. We can't let the ox have any of that. No, let him, let him eat while he is going to give him the energy and strength so that he can go forward. The same thing goes for the pastor teacher. We shall not muzzle him by making him do other things other than studying and teaching, studying and teaching. If we don't provide for the pastor teacher, he's got to go out and get a job because he's got to provide for himself and also for his family. So we ought to provide for him so that he can serve us and give us the good grain, feed us the good bread of God's Word on a consistent basis. <clears throat> and so as I said, I'm nothing but a big dumb ox here trying to thresh for you, and you know, so just treat me that way and you know, feed me once in a while, please, okay? <laughs> But in any case, there's another uh, a thing I just want to mention in this that uh, when I get back again and uh, looking at emails this morning, I noticed uh, from uh, uh, Pastor Robert Dean down in uh, Houston, Texas, uh, again, who uh, learned under Colonel Theme as I have and uh, a good friend and good pastor as well and went down to some of his conferences down there. But he's down in Houston, Texas, and uh, sent out a couple of emails that were very alarming in our nation today. And ultimately, I don't know if you know the story, but uh, uh, the city of Houston elected a female uh, mayor. And it's not the fact that she's female, but she's a lesbian, and she's an open lesbian, and ultimately has an agenda. And so what she is trying to pass through the legislation now in Houston is uh, several things. One is that a pastor can't teach the Word of God, especially when it says anything bad about homosexuality, gay, uh, or, or lesbian. And the Word of God, as you know, is ultimately against homosexuality. We read that in Galatians chapter 6. We understand that and throughout the rest of Scripture. So they're trying to muzzle the ox in a different way. Let him not speak openly. And there's also, she's trying to pass a law to subpoena the, the sermons that these pastors teach in Houston. And so basically, you have to submit your sermon to the mayor either before or after the fact. And then she can go over it and say, oh, you broke our law, go to jail, or whatever the case may be. 
I'll tell you, it's coming in our country, and it's amazing. You think of Houston, Texas, and that's where, you know, Pastor Thiem had his ministry, and his son is now continuing uh, down there in Houston, Texas, continuing on the ministry. Pastor uh, uh, Robbie Dean is down there. Uh, Bruce Bumgarner, another great pastor teacher, friend of mine that I met down there, he's down there. And also, you also know Joel Osteen is down there as well, who has that mega church. But unfortunately, he'll never come out against these types of things because he's all about, you know, let's just all get along rather than what does the Word of God have to say. But it's amazing because, again, you're down in the Bible bait. You're at the epicenter of Bible doctrine and the teaching of the truth of the Word of God. There's all kinds of doctrinal teachers down there, and yet that society still elects a, 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 a homosexual a mayor that has an agenda. And again, without getting into too much uh, politics this morning, but you know that all also, as, as most uh, negative things happen, you know, started in here in uh, Massachusetts, where, you know, I remember uh, working uh, back in business back in the early 90s and ultimately, you know, forcing the companies or having the companies now start to recognize gay and homosexual marriages. And then one by one, they all just fell in line. And how did they do that? Did, did they let the people vote? No. What they did is they used the court system, and they had one judge, and a judge would pass a rule and say, you have to recognize homosexual marriage now in our state, and then everybody just falls in line. <clears throat> Again, they do it subvertly. They do it uh, 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 evil <clears throat> in an evil uh, uh, way. They're using our co uh, court systems that are corrupted, and ultimately they are attacking the Word of God, and they're attacking it uh, right uh, blatantly out in the open. So again, uh, you know, we need to stand up for these things. We need to speak out against these things and ultimately not just let them run us over roughshod uh, and uh, not al uh, allow them to remove our freedoms. And as you know, our Constitution, forget the Bible, okay? Our Constitution says freedom of speech and separation from church and state. And so the state, in other words, the government should never dictate what a pastor can and cannot do. Never, ever, ever. It's right there in our Constitution. So is this law, if this law gets passed, again, again, I'm sure they'll go up to the Supreme Court, and they've been pretty good about upholding our Constitution in these matters thus far, and it should get shot down ultimately. But again, it's always the first shot, you know? And right now you're seeing it, but, you know, 10, 15 years from now, we'll all say, okay, yeah, okay, let's just do it. And the Supreme Court will change over, and there'll be people in there probably that will uphold these types of rules. And the sad thing is, is that they say, oh, this is all about freedom, to give us gays freedom to live. Well, you know what? The reason that they're out in the open today is because we do give them freedom. If you want to be gay, go be gay. Don't force it on me, though. I'm not forcing my religion on you. Don't force your gayness on me, okay? Freedom is freedom. You see, they want freedom when you go along with what they say, and that's the problem. And that's what bullying, in the, you know, they call us hate mongers because we preach what the Bible has to say. We say, it's wrong. And they say, oh, that's hateful. But they're the hate mongers when they try to force it down our throats and they use bully tactics as I've given you several examples, Washington Redskins and all that other stuff over the last couple of weeks. So in any case, okay, without uh, getting up on the soapbox for too long, Ultimately, that's another way of muzzling the ox. And again, uh, you know, speak out against these things. And uh, certainly, if anybody is, has those types of agendas, please uh, vote against them in the upcoming elections here in November uh, because they are stepping on not just the Bible and, and God's Word. You know, God can deal with that. You know, God's, you know, if you're in a communist society, you know, Christianity flourishes. You go to China, Christianity's flourishing. And they can't, you know, they'll be killed and in, in, imprisoned for speaking out Christianity. But again, they're also stepping on our Constitution and the freedoms that we have within our country. And this is just one of the stepping stones of losing those types of freedoms within our society. And if it starts here, you know, it's just going to be, you know, a domino effect, you know, for all kinds of freedoms that we already are losing, but will lose even more in the future. But in any case, uh, uh, that's uh, not the topic that we're here to t study this morning because we're here to learn about giving and how we are to give in a gracious way, giving to our fellow mankind, giving to our uh, fellow brethren inside the church, giving to our pastor teacher, and giving to all mankind as we have means to do so. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, and 7, it says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. In other words, if you're going to be cheap, you're going to get cheapness in return. He who sows bountifully, again, if you're going to be gracious, he will reap bountifully. In other words, you'll have God's grace pouring into your life as well. 
Then it goes on to say, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Don't let anybody coerce you into what you do and do not give. Do it with an open heart, with an open mind between you and God, and just do it. And do it in love and have joy and happiness in your soul for what you have done. In Proverbs 11, remember we studied this already, verses 24 and 25. There is one who scatters, again, gives generously, and yet increases all the more. There is one who withholds what is justly due, again, the stingy individual, and yet it results only in want. And again, the, uh, the translate that in the Hebrew to impo- impoverishment. The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Again, and this is a principle that many Christians don't get, you know. We want to hold on to our purses. We want to hold on to the money that God has blessed us with. But we don't realize that the, the, the blessing of God says if you give, guess what? He's going to give you even more because he knows you how to ha- have a heart of giving. And he wants to give to you so you can continue that generosity, that grace. You continue to be bountiful, continue to show the love of God in your life. But if we're going to hold it back and hold on to the purse strings of our wallets or whatever, again, we're not going to have the grace of God be poured out onto us as it could be. So again, we need to give graciously and give bountifully as we have means to do so. All right, so now when we look at verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Again, the same principle. But the first part of this is do not be deceived. You see, this is an important term here, and this is what Christians fall into. Again, these Galatians were Christians, but they were deceived by what? The Judaizers that said, go back to the law. And you have to do certain things in order to be saved, in order to be accepted by God, which were false doctrines. They were being deceived. And so Paul, again, is warning them, warning all of us, don't be deceived. Because we can be deceived within ourselves, and especially within giving, because the world says it's all about you. Give to yourself. Line your own pockets. You know, indulge yourself. You know, uh, live, the, you know, live the gusto. Grab all the gusto you can. That's what the world tells us to do. And it says, hold on, hold on, hold on. And don't help when you can help. Don't give when you are able to give. But God's Word says what? Give, and guess what? you'll be blessed even more. Give, and He will continue to bless you. And you will have all the gusto this world can offer. You will have those things, especially in eternity, and and, and then you can also uh, will receive them in time. But you see, the world doesn't give us that information. The world spins it in a different way, in a negative way, and therefore we become stingy and cheap, and we keep things to ourselves, and we don't help one another. And so one of the great dangers of the Christian life is to be self-deceived, to have deception, to allow Satan's cosmic viewpoint to come into our soul and to ignore Bible doctrine. And when we don't have the Word of God, when we ignore the Word of God, and we don't heed principles like what we're learning this morning in Galatians chapter 6, we will be deceived and we'll think what we are doing is right, and yet it will be oh so wrong. So again, go back to the Word of God. This is truth. This is righteousness. This is love. This is grace. This is what God desires for all of us. This is what we need to do. Not what the world tells us to do, but what God tells us to do. And remember, He's the eternal God. The world ain't going to be around forever. At best, we've got, or or at least, I should say, at least we've got 1,007 years of human history left. After that, we're in eternity, and this world that we know will be destroyed. So again, if you're going to pony up to something, you're going to pony up to this world, you're going to pony up to the eternal God and what he says. Again, I'm going to pony up to the eternal God. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm heading for. And that's what we all should do. And stop you know, being deceived by what does the world say? What does the world say? And remember, when I tell you these things, you know, God doesn't want us to all be poor. Again, we can't all be poor. Because if we're all poor, we have nothing to give, right? We can't help in society. We can't support doctrinal teaching. We can't do these things. So God will bless us and will give us the means to do His will and His Word. But if we aren't using His blessings to do His will and His Word, again, you know, He could stop giving. And He may hold back the reins, as it says. And we won't be in a place of blessing by God as we should be. So uh, as we see, God is not mocked. In other words, you can't fool God. You know, you can't trick God. You can't say one thing and be another. And that's what Paul gets into this uh, when we get into verses 11 through 18, the hypocrisy that we can have. 
that he warns us, uh, you know, not to be or, or not to have within our life. And then when we get into verse 8, again, this is that reap what you sow principle, both in the positive and the negative. Remember, this goes both ways. It's not just all negative, negative. It's positive and negative. If we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap from the flesh. We're going to reap corruption as a result. If we sow to the Spirit, we'll, we'll, from the Spirit, we'll reap eternal life. <clears throat> So just to break it down a little bit for you, <clears throat> what does it mean to sow to the flesh? Well, ultimately, that's the self-indulgent type of individual, the self-deceived, self-indulgent. Uh, In other words, your sin nature tempts you to do something that is very humanistic, that's very worldly, that's very cosmic, that's very sinful at times. And so therefore, you're tempted. You know, it's all about me. It's all about me. So I'm just going to take care of me, and I'm not going to think about anybody else in my life. And so we self-indulge based on the temptation that the sin nature tells us. Again, I wish I had a, a buck in my wallet, but I don't right now because I spent it all. Just kidding, okay. But if I had a dollar, I'd be, you know, you know, people are like, oh, well, let me just hold that back and keep it for me. You know? When they have an opportunity to just give, let it go. God gave it to you, let it go. It's not yours. Okay? It's God's. Let God use it. And so when we sow to the flesh, again, we do things that are self-indulgent, all for ourselves. We don't give, we don't give, we don't give. And our, and our sin nature is telling us, oh, you better watch out. You know, the economy's getting bad. You know, you, you, you know you're going to have difficulty you, you know, down the road. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. The stock market could crash. You know, the sky could be falling. All these things. Again, so you don't give as a result of fear of the future. Now, remember, as I go through all of this, keep in the back of your mind that, you know, first and foremost, every one of us need to provide for our families. That's the first thing that you need to do, provide for your family. And then from after that, if you're doing that, then God says of the, of the addition, of the bounty that you have in addition to that, now you're able to give. You give to the church, give to people within the church where they have need, give people outside the church, and that's what verse 10 is all about. But remember, take care of the family first. Again, then our church and our pastor teacher second. Other people then come third outside the church. And give as God provides for you. And if you have the heart of giving, God's going to provide for your family. He's going to provide for you and your church. He's going to provide for other people as well through you. He's, you're going to be a blessing to all kinds of people and things. But again, if we hold back and we, you know, it's all just about us and our self-indulgence, then ultimately we're going to miss out on these blessings and reaping corrupt, corruption. Ultimately, our soul is just going to be t destroyed, as it were. Again, not literally, but again, mentally and spiritually. Again, we're going to have a wrong negative attitude. We're going to have wrong thinking. And ultimately, it could lead us to the divine discipline down the, down the road because we're living in reversionism. We're not living in the Word of God. But then when we have sowing by the Spirit, again, God the Holy Spirit, walking by the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit to apply the Word of God and give graciously, give openly, and give with a free heart. Again, then we will reap blessings. Again, abiding by the mandates of the Word of God to give and to love and to be gracious, produce the fruit of the Spirit as we have in chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 giving of ourselves. <clears throat> and then as it says, and I just want to clarify this for you because, you, you know, this can be mistranslated, but it says at the end, he who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, if uh, you were uh, from the persuasion of you can lose your salvation, you'd say, well, there it is. If I'm not a giver, I'm going to lose my salvation, but that's not what it's all about. The context of all of this and the eternal life here is talking about what the afterlife will have for you. So and again, reaping eternal life doesn't mean you're going to get eternal life because you have given. There's only one way to get eternal life, and that's through belief in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His work on the cross to pay for your sins so that you would have everlasting life. But to reap eternal life means the better blessings in the eternal state. Remember, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, all believers, and our works are going to be judged. And the things that we did that are considered to be the fruit of the Spirit, when we were led by the filling of the Holy Spirit, God says that's gold, silver, and precious gems. In other words, it's reward to us in the eternal state. It's a body of glory that we're going to have that can reflect as bright as the sun. 
And so reaping eternal life is talking about what's going to come in the future when we get to the eternal state and have greater blessings at that time. And again, you know, you, you, you know, every one of us, I'm sure, thinks this way. And, uh, you know, you talk to a lot of people as well. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I just hope I get there. Okay? Yeah, that's good. And it's going to be great and fantastic. Okay? But again, it'll be even better if we go forward in God's plan right now in time. We'll have even a better eternal life, an even better uh, authority and responsibility in, in the eternal state, even more ability to glorify God for all of eternity. And as I've shared with you before, you know, if you uh, looked at uh, in the military, and if I put up here in their full dress uniforms, I put, the, you know, a, a private in the Marines, and then I give you, you know, a five-star general in the Marines, and I line them up next to each other. You're going to look at that private and you say, wow, those are really cool clothes. You know, he's, he's really dressed to the hilt. He looks good. And he'll have maybe one or two badges on his chest and, you know, a stripe. And then you look over at that general, he's going to have that same beautiful uniform but on that, he's got all kinds of decorations, all kinds of armor, things on the shoulders, things, you know, clusters on the hat, you know, you know, stars everywhere. And when he walks around, you see the difference between the two. They're both in the Marines. They're both fantastic individuals. They're both courageous, and they're both, uh, you know, awesome soldiers. But one is highly decorated, and the other is less decorated. And the same is going to go for us in the eternal state. You know, we're all going to get there. We're all going to get there. It's going to be wonderful and fantastic. But we have opportunity to be highly decorated or less decorated. And again, even at that, we shouldn't say, well, I want to be, you know, you know it shouldn't be an ego thing. But our, really, our motivation should be, I want to be like the general who glorifies not himself, but he, uh, he glorifies the country. He, uh, he glorifies the Marines when he is more highly decorated. Yes, he receives glory there, but really he's standing up there because it's about the Marines and our country that he is standing up for, and he has glorified them. And the same goes for us. It should be not about us, but we're glorifying God and how much we can glorify Jesus Christ. And another way to say it is how much can you thank Christ in the eternal state for what he has done for you? And the more you can glorify him with that decorated uh, you know, uniform of glory in the eternal state, the more you can do that and have more glory shining brighter as the sun in the eternal state rather than just a little bitty star that you can barely see in the night, you are giving more thanks to God and to his son, Jesus Christ, for all of eternity by living in that body. So again, that's what it's all about, and uh, that's what this reaping eternal life is all about. It's about going forward in the glory of God. Again, yes, we receive blessings, but again, we are able to have a more fantastic eternal life and bring more glory, give more thanks to Him in that eternal state. Now in verse 9, it says, And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So here we have an ex exhortation uh, to... Be patient, to have endurance, because, you know, you know, many times, you know, what you do in the Christian life doesn't have an immediate return. You know, Satan's world tries to give an immediate return for everything that you do, okay? And he tries to shorten up that immediate return because he knows, you know, that ring, you know, it's like Pavlov's dog, you know, you ring the bell and he starts to salva salivate because he knows he's going to get a piece of crumb to eat, Okay? And that's what Satan's cause, that's what we learned in psychology back in college, okay? But, or in high school. But <clears throat> in any case, that's what Satan's cosmic system tries to do to you. And it gets you in this mentality that if I'm going to do something, I want immediate return. And that can bleed over into our spiritual life, that if I do something, I should get something right away. But God says in due time, have patience, have endurance. Yes, you know, trust in the Lord. That's all part of your faith that God is going to be faithful to His Word. If you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Be faithful. Doesn't that mean it's going to happen tomorrow? But it will happen. It certainly is, will happen in the eternal state, and it will happen in time as well. And so again, have endurance and be faithful and wait for God to fulfill His promises within your life. And He will. And that's why it says, keep on having endurance. And uh, continuing on in verses 9 and 10, keep on having that endurance. Let us not lose heart. Again, let us not lose heart in doing good. Now, what's interesting about this phrase, losing heart, it doesn't use the Greek word cardia that talks about the blood-pumping organ and many times the mentality of your soul. 
But it uses a word in, in the Greek, kakos, that uh, ultimately means bad or evil. But when it's used, with, it's got a prefix on it, so it comes to be a little uh, something different. And it ultimately means to faint or to grow weary and, and that kind of thing. Okay? Let us not lose heart. And as it says at the end, do not grow weary. Again, those phrases come together. And it means not to you know, wear out, not to be spiritually drained. And so, therefore, let us not let this world run us down. Let us not be Pavlov's dog and expect the, you know, the bone to drop, and you know, if it doesn't, we're all upset, and then discouraged in what we do. But keep going each and every day, and keep do, uh, going uh, in doing good. Uh, poieo is the generic Greek word for doing, so let's just do it. And then kalos is good. This is not agathos, which is typically the word for good in the Greek, but kalos. And I give you that because it means something that is noble or beautiful. And in the Greek, it meant something on the outside that was fantastic. So we're not talking about inner beauty or inner goodness or you know, the inner being as agathos would lead us to have, that which we are supposed to have as well. But here we have kalos that emphasizes the outer being. In other words, as the Word of God tells us, we've got to take care of the inside first. You've got to take care of your soul first and have goodness within your soul and the mentality of your soul. Do that first. And as a result of that, now you can do good, kalos, on the outside. In other words, you can give, you can give, you can give. And you show the grace of God. You show the love of God. You show the fruit of the Spirit in what you're doing. And other people see that, <clears throat> excuse me, in you. And so doing good doesn't mean, you know, what's going on in your soul as much as it means what's going on on the outside. What are you doing? And this is the doing that we are to do. And this is the kind of good that we are to, to, that we are to uh, operate and function in. But remember, you've got to have it on the inside first so that it can reflect itself on the outside and you can do the will of God. So again, it's the outward expression of what's going on in your inner soul. Again, if your inner soul is corrupted and you have, you know, demons running around in your soul, we use that in a, a, a not a literal sense, but a, a figurative sense. You know, if you've got the sin nature going on and uh, sin r running rampant in your soul, you're not going to be able to be beautiful on the outside. And given the analogy that I just gave to you about our eternal glory, it's interesting that if we show that good on the outside, again, we do good, again, that divine good production on the outside, when we get the eternal state, that's going to be reflected on the outside body for all of eternity. So again, you've got to do the actions here on earth, have grace, have love, help other people in this life with the means that God has given you to help them, time, talent, and treasure. And then as a result, in the eternal state, you're going to have that outward beauty as well. When you have that uniform of glory that is fully decorated like a five-star general, uh, as we would have in our analogy. So again, having that outward beauty. And not lose heart. Again, let's not become mentally discouraged. Again, you know, it does, you don't always get the reward for the thing that you've done right away. But God has promised it, and God's not a liar. Again, you know the Word of God. You know God doesn't lie. He says He will give, and He will give in both time and in eternity. So do not lose heart. Again, that, the, the uh, root word of that word for heart, kekos, meant evil or bad. So literally we could say do not do bad. But when it comes down in the figurative usage within the Greek, it means do not grow weary. Do not lose heart. You know, don't be discouraged. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And don't look for the reward. That's another thing we could say. It's not about the rewards we get or the blessings that God gives to us. It's the heart of giving in the Christ-like nature. It's the heart of love, of laying down our lives for our friends. That should be our heart. And then don't keep your eye on, oh, did, did I get back what I just gave? Let that go. So again, don't become mentally discouraged. Don't become faint of mind and keep going forward. Keep going forward. And uh, also, this is in a, a type of subjunctive mood here that basically is saying, Paul is saying to us right now, this is the mode of operation I have. I want you to join in with me. It's, used, it's a subjunctive mood that's used as a command, almost like the imperative mood. And basically saying, hey, this is where I'm going. I want you to come along with me. And it's a command to come along, come along. 
you know, come along with me and let's go forward in this. And as I've got here on the board, as 1 Timothy 6.12 says, keep fighting the good fight of faith. Paul says, I'm, I'm leading the charge. I'm going in that direction. I want you to follow along with me. And that's what we need to do each and every day. Follow along. And that goes back to what we noted earlier in chapter 6, or actually chapter 5. Uh, uh, yeah, chapter 5, verse 25. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's be in step march, lock step march with the Holy Spirit. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Let's fight the good fight of faith. And then as it says, for in time we ourselves shall reap. And again, that reap eternal life, again, we see another uh, same thing going on here, just said in a different way, for in time we ourselves shall reap. This is a promise of God. And so whether it be, the, it, it, basically it's talking about future blessings, future tense here. And that future is in time and then also leading off into eternity as well. In time, we ourselves will reap. Again, you sowed the seed. You sowed the seed of faith. You sowed the seed of love, of grace, of giving. You've sowed that seed. And in time, you too will have a harvest. In other words, God will bless you bountifully in uh, time and then also in eternity. <clears throat> and then as we have here, if we don't grow weary, and this is an interesting uh, Greek word that I had to uh, share with you just so we see some of the differences. May, oh, me, and may is how you pronounce that, M-E. Uh, that's one of the Greek negatives for not. And then ek is a, is a prefix. It means out or out from. And then luo means loosing, loosing, okay? Not losing, but loosing, okay? And ultimately, what we, it, it says if we do not loose, okay? And that's, you know, what would we loose? And again, if we aren't walking by the Spirit, when we enter into sin, we're what? Loosing the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're setting Him free. He's not with us any longer. You see, when you're filled with the Spirit, just to put it in these terms, we're holding Him captive. He's inside of us. He's working inside of us, and we're holding on to Him. But when we enter into sin and Satan's cosmic viewpoint, we're loosing the Spirit. In other words, we're letting Him go. In other words, we're not us utilizing His power. The same goes for the Word of God. When we loose the Word of God, it means we're not utilizing it here. And so again, the root of this speaks volumes of, you know, letting go of the Word of God, letting go of the Holy Spirit, not applying the Word in the Spirit. And then as, it, as it's used in the Greek, it ultimately means, you know, again, you know, to lose something, but ultimately, you, you know, you're famished, okay? And you have the negative there, do not do this, okay? In other words, you're tired, you're, you're worn out. <coughs> And you get tired and you get worn out due to, you know, sinning and the missteps in the spiritual life, the trespasses that we commit, the, the sins that we can commit, living in Satan's cosmic system. And basically you're saying no to God. You're giving him a stiff arm, as I like to say. You say, here's the Holy Spirit. I don't need you. You're giving a stiff arm to the Word of God. Don't need you. I'm going to operate over here on my own. And that will wear you out. That will wear you out. So again, if we do not grow weary. In other words, we forget about the promises of God. We forget about the blessings that God has promised to us. We forget about reaping in the eternal state. We become impatient. And we want to be Pavlov's dog, and we want it right now. So again, if we do not grow weary, conditional clause, if and we do, okay, we will reap. We will reap. So we do so, again, not by grieving or quenching God the Holy Spirit. You know Ephesians 4.30, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Again, grieving the Holy Spirit means you're, you've sinned and you know, He's not operating and functioning within you as He should. Quenching Him means you've thrown a, you know, a big bucket of water over the flame and it's kaput. You know? No more flame burning inside of you. Again, you never lose the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about the filling and His empowering and His enabling ministry. And we grieve and we quench him by saying no to him, no to the word of God and living by our sin nature and how the world wants us to live. And so again, we do not grow weary by continuing to abide in the word of God. Stay filled with the spirit, confess your sins when you need to, keep going, learning the word of God on a consistent basis. And this is why Paul exhorts us, uh, exhorts us to keep moving forward, keep going forward and all these verses up here. Again, 1 Corinthians 15 and 16, uh, Philippians 1, 2, 4, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 3. 
all these verses, Paul's like, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. You know, as Paul said at the end of his life, he said, I finished the cause. I've run the race. I finished the cause. I did it. I did what God wanted me to do, and now he's going to take me home. And I think he was only like somewhere in his 50s. He wasn't that old. But he did God's will for the time that God had allotted for him. And he knew God said, I'm done. You know, it's time for you to come home. And he took him home. And Paul went home satisfied, knowing that he did what God wanted him to do. And that he exhorts us to do the same. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Again, you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't, you don't have to save 10 million people. You don't have to have a mega church. Okay? You just do what God wants you to do every day. And that's God's will for your life. Just keep going, keep going, keep moving forward. And the other thing is, you know, moving forward means don't become stagnant and certainly do not go back in your spiritual walk. You know, keep going, keep going, keep going. Just keep going forward. Keep walking forward. Keep learning and growing. And don't just stay, you know, treading water. Oh, I learned that 10 years ago. That's all I need. I'm just going to keep doing that. Okay? Keep going, keep going. There's more for you. There's more that God wants. There's more for you to do. As long as we're all here, uh, you know, alive today and we wake up every morning, God's got a plan for you. And that plan means, you know, uh, glorifying Him, you know, uh, uh, and uh, for you to continue to grow spiritually, continue to go forward. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 55, uh, 50, 80, that's why he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Again, it's not in vain. You're not just wasting your time here, folks. You know? Yeah, you could all be doing something else this morning. But you're here. Because hopefully you realize you're not wasting your time. And everything you do day in and day out is not a waste of time. It has significant ramifications within this life and in the life to come. And it's glorifying to God. It's blessings to other people. It's helping others in a fantastic way. So Paul's recipe for success is that in the spiritual life is to persevere in the hardships, you know, don't grow weary, don't lose heart, continue to have endurance, and always continue to walk performing divine good. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm going to wrap up in just a minute in verse 10, get a couple things in there, but it feels like I should wrap up right now, but I'm going to keep going because i got one more good thing to say to you. I mean, several more good things to say to you. But in any case, 2 Timothy 2.12, James chapter 1.12, Matthew 10.22, and also in ver, uh, chapter 24, verse 13. Keep going forward. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Don't let Satan's, you know, the cosmic system beat you down. You know, and, and you know, cosmic system is, oh, you should be this, but you, you feel like you're only down here according to cosmic or worldly standards. Don't worry about that, Okay. You are where God wants you to be. Keep going forward and open up that heart. Open up that heart of grace. Open up that heart of love to be more giving in your life, wherever you are. If you're already up here, if you're down here, be more giving. And don't do it because you want to receive a reward. Do it because you want to do it and because God wants you to do it and because that's God's will for your life. And help other people. Help your church, help your family, help other people, whether they be believers or unbelievers. And so let's look at verse 10. We'll wrap up. It says, so then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So again, all men, that's believers and unbelievers. You can help unbelievers in this life. You can give to unbelievers in this life. You know, uh, one of the misnomers that uh, people say, oh, you're cleaning up the devil's world by helping an unbeliever. No. No. There are things that you can do to clean up the devil's world that you should not be doing. But to help an unbeliever, you're showing them the Christ-like nature. Christ died for unbelievers. He gave himself for unbelievers. We should too. If you have to jump on a grenade for an unbeliever, do it. Do it. Because you should. And you'll show the love of Christ. And if we never help the unbeliever, how would they see the love of Christ? So again, take that phrase, cleaning up the devil's world, out of your head in the way that it's probably locked in there. And yeah, there are charities and things like that you shouldn't deal with, okay? 
but there are times when you should be helping. And again, our help should be, especially, you know, none of us are millionaires here, okay? None of us are millionaires here. So our help should be on a personal basis, a one-on-one -on -one basis. Help the unbeliever where you can, rather than just give to a big charity and who knows what happens. And when you do give, make sure they know where it's coming from. Not you, but God above and Christ. And use it as an opportunity to witness. Give to the unbeliever. But, as it says, especially to the household of faith, which means within the church, help out your fellow brothers and sisters in the church first. Again, support the pastor teacher. And then if there's abundance of time, talent, or treasure, go help the unbeliever. Or if God gives you, you know, the opportunity, go help the unbeliever. Now, I, I want to go back to this phrase. So then while we have opportunity to do good, let us do good. Okay? Now this good... I'm going to pass through this. It's a different Greek word, okay? And it basically means the works that you do. It's not poieto that I showed you earlier, but this doing here is really, you know, energy, you know, really powered. You know, go out and do the good works of God. I'll leave this up on the board, but I just want to clarify this. So then while we have opportunity, okay? I didn't put this on a slide. I thought I put this on a slide, but I might have taken it out. Let me just look real quick. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here it is. While we have opportunity, you see, you have a unique opportunity in this life and only in this life to do good. You see, in the eternal state, it's all good. It's all righteousness. It's all glory. Everything's good. There's no not doing good or doing good. There's no choice. We'll only do good and be good and around good for all of eternity. But while we're here on planet Earth, we're surrounded by what? Sin, evil, wickedness, Satan, fallen angels, fallen de you know, demons. We're surrounded. We have a sin nature. You see, we have lots of opportunity to not do good. And, it's a, it, and it, sometimes it's a fight and struggle to do, do good. I didn't say too many do-do's in that, okay? <laughs> All right. You see, this, is the only this life is the only opportunity we have in a unique way to glorify God. Because we can do evil, we can do sin, we can do all kinds of other things. But now we have a free will choice to either do good or not do good. In the eternal state, no free will choice to do or not do good. We'll only have choice to do good in the eternal state. Amen. Let's get an amen on that one, okay? Can't wait for that day. But, then, but now is our unique opportunity. And that's why we're blessed in the eternal state, because it's unique. Sin nature could lead you. you know, this world could lead you. Satan can lead you. Other things can lead you. Or the Holy Spirit can lead you. The Word of God can lead you. And with your volition, choose for true good versus the things of this world. So it's a unique opportunity. And that's why we're blessed in a fantastic way. And so, again, we ought to direct all our good uh, towards the furthering of God's will and word for our life, uh, led by His word, led by His spirit to our church, our support our pastor teachers, and then also, ultimately, to the unbelievers of this world to lay down our lives uh, as Christ laid down His life for us. All right, so let's close there in prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for uh, this fantastic lesson of grace and giving and love. And Father, we just ask that your word come mightily into our souls more and more each and every day. And your spirit uh, work even harder within us to help us to cycle this word and also apply it so that our outward beauty truly glorifies you. And so, Father, we thank you for this time that we have together. In Christ's name, amen. All right, and uh, so now on Sunday morning is our time to uh, partake of an offering and time to give and to give, uh, be able to give graciously to God for all that He has done uh, for us and in appreciation. And hopefully th you thinking that I am worthy of your double honor and all that good stuff. If I'm never worthy, just let me know and smack me upside the head. Straighten me out. All right, so uh, now's the time to give, uh, and uh, as uh, we just read in Galatians 6, uh, give graciously and uh, not under compulsion as we also read in Corinthians. Again, don't, we don't tithe, we don't pledge, we don't you know, do it to, so other people can see what we're doing, but again, it's all between us and God and what we've purposed uh, uh, to do for God 
within our hearts. Let's just pray for our offering. Father, we thank you for the bounty that you've given to us, and we ask that you help us to share that bounty gracefully. And we, all that we are able to give, Father, we ask that it meets the needs of our pastor and his family and also of our local assembly so that we can reach out to those who are lost and dying uh, in this world and to our fellow brethren. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Where the tears fall.